to that. It's very important to understand that. Okay. Um, so this comes to an end in the 1970s. Because of the conditions we went over, I'm not going to do it again, the rise in the supply of people looking for work and the cut in the demand for jobs because of export of jobs and computerization and so on. And so workers produce more and more, as they always did before, become more productive, work with better machines, work more skillfully, work with better supervision, all the rest. The productivity keeps rising, but the wages go nowhere. This gets larger and larger, this gap, as time progresses, the 70s, the 80s, and 90s. It's a wonderful time. The numbers, the, the, the curves are actually a little bit different shape than this. This is just to give you the basic idea. But it gets generally this way. So as the 70s move into the 80s, move into the 90s, this is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's where our story really begins. What does this mean? Well, it means that the growth in the economy, the growth in value produced, is not going to the mass of working people who would normally earn a good portion of it and go out and spend it on food, clothing, and shelter, have their little savings accounts. The normal life of the normal mass of the American people is suddenly becoming a less important economic player because a disproportionate amount of the goods and services, the value being produced, is accruing to whoever gets their hands on this. And the first hands are the employer's hands. The employer who gets the fruit of the rising productivity and enjoys, from his perspective, the benefit of not having to share that with the workers. So what begins to happen is wealth rapidly concentrates in a way it had not done before in the hands of employers who are a relatively small part of our society. And the first thing that happens, sort of follow this with me, that what happens is they put the money, think of it this way, they put the money in the bank. The corporations take these mushrooming profits and they put them in the bank. What else are they going to do with them initially? I mean, they're not going to leave them there, but suddenly the banks become awash in money that is not parceled out among lots of little people who have a little account for their checking and their saving, and that come and pick that money up pretty quick, or write checks pretty quick, or have to pull money out of their savings account to give their nephew a birthday present, blah, blah, blah. Instead, it's corporations, a much smaller number of account holders, holding huge bundles of money and wondering what to do with it. Why? Because since the, the workers are not buying a lot of stuff, because their wages aren't going anywhere, at least initially, their wages aren't going anywhere, they're not buying a lot of stuff, it's clear to businesses that expanding production here in the United States would make no sense. The market isn't expanding, the market is changing. If you do invest, and here comes the last 30 years, if you are going to invest in production, you're going to invest in production to produce things for the people who are going to be having money over these 30 years. And who are they? It's the people who get their hands on profits. So let's go through them. First, it's the top executives of the company. Who decides what to do with the profit of a company when it goes nutty because of these phenomena? The answer is the board of directors. Most of the business in this country is done by corporations, overwhelmingly. And corporations are organized overwhelmingly, that is the, the major ones, in the following structure. At the very top of the structure is a board of directors, 15 to 20 people on average who are elected annually by the shareholders under a rule, this is all specified in law, one share, one vote. So if you have a million shares, you get a million votes for who's a board of directors. If you have one share that your grandma gave you when you were 12, then you get one vote. Large corporations have hundreds of millions of shares outstanding, and every year hundreds of millions of shares get to vote once a year on who's on the board of directors. So if you own no shares, you have no votes. 
and you have one share, you have one vote. If you have a hundred million shares, you have a hundred million votes. Therefore, folks, this is an arrangement in which a very small number of people, rough number, one percent of people, one percent of shareholders own seventy-five percent of all the shares in the United States. It's highly concentrated, so it's a very small number of people who dominate the board of director, uh, dominate the shareholders, who in turn elect the board of directors. What does the board of directors do? It makes all the basic decisions of an enterprise. It decides what to produce, how to produce, where to produce, and what to do with the profits that are earned. That's the responsibility of the board of directors. They do it. Once a year, in a sense, the shareholders say whether or not they approve of what the board is doing by voting for them to stay there or voting for somebody else. Most boards are self-selecting and self-reproducing because most shareholders don't bother. If you have 100 shares of GE, you get it once a year, you get invited to the annual meeting. You must be. It's the law. You are told the annual meeting will take place at the Sheraton Hotel in Cleveland or wherever they hold it. And you, as a shareholder, are entitled to go. You actually get a credential. You can go there and they have to let you in the auditorium. And you, if you ever do this, which is an instructive activity, if you've never had it, I urge you to do it, you will understand something you might not have grasped before. First, if you look at the documents you get once a year, it's called a proxy statement. It's a, just a, a little document telling you where the meeting will be, when it will be, and what sort of the agenda are for this meeting, and that you will have votes according to the number of shares that you have. And it'll be in the Sheraton Hotel in, in, in Cleveland. And your first, your brain will go, Wait a minute. It says here there are 406 million shares outstanding. And if you call up the Sheraton Hotel in Cleveland, you'll notice that the ballroom that's assigned for the meeting has 342 seats in it. So you realize that the large majority of the shareholders don't show up. Why don't they show up? Because there's no point in it. A few shareholders, either individuals or companies or banks that hold shares for individuals, they'll send some representatives and each of them, because of all the shares they either control or own, they'll do the bulk of the voting. You come there with your hundred shares, you're exactly as relevant to the proceedings as the waitress who brings you coffee during the meeting. Other than that, you have no role. She knows that this is a silly game, you don't. And if you talk to her, she'll explain it to you because you actually went, having taken a civics class, and believing that you are relevant to this process. You are not. But it, it's the game. It's the rule. Right? So the board of directors are the first people who get their hands on this. What does the board of directors supposed to do? Well, basically, the board of directors is supposed to make all of its decisions, including how to use the profits, in terms of what's in the best interest of the company that they're the board of directors of. That's the rule. That's the kind of understanding. And the shareholders want the board to manage and run the company in the best possible way. So the board has to now decide what to do with this new situation, an exploding profit story. And what have they done? First, first, the board of directors gives huge salary increases. It starts in the 1970s. Just Spectacular. The things you're reading about nowadays, big bonuses, all of that really got going in the 1970s. Before that, the American uh, top managers and so on got paid well. I mean, they certainly weren't poverty-stricken folks, but not in the stratosphere the way they are now, where they are the envy of, of executives in other countries who pay themselves well, but not like that. It becomes millions of dollars, then it becomes tens of millions of dollars, then it becomes hundreds of millions of dollars, and with some that I'm sure you've read about, billions of dollars. Just wild. And in order to keep the whole company happy, you can't just give the top four guys huge packages of, of money because it'll lead to trouble trouble with what's called middle management, lower management. So after a while, you give them a lot, but to keep everybody from squawking, you sort of throw the largesse down the staircase and let others get involved in it. Bonuses get spread out to more and more people. 
Okay? So you begin to develop a peculiar society. Why? Because the workers' wages are flat. But another group of people, those who are at the top end of the corporate sector, are getting more and more rich. The gap between them and the workers gets larger. It's a very dramatic number, as you can see. These people, the top managers, who might have in the 70s, I don't have the exact numbers in my head, might have on average gotten 30 times what an average worker does, now get 300 times that. I mean, you know, real widening of the inequality of income in the United States. And this is the lead element of that. But it's not just corporate executives, although they give it to themselves in very great largesse. Remember, the board of directors, and I can see some of you may not like what I'm about to say, so let me say it again. The board of directors makes the decision. The board of directors pays wages and salaries to all <coughs> managers. The board of directors is also in charge of paying itself fees. So you are a member. I'll do that again. The board of directors sets its own fees. Typically on a board of directors, the top three or four managers of a company, the president, senior vice president, sit. And so they go through the following ritual. I kid you not, this is how it's done. Let's say it's 18 people, they sit around, and they break up the board. By the way, for those of you who think of it, capitalists as individuals, very few of that. Capitalists are groups, they're collectives. The board of directors is a collective of people that makes collective decisions about profits. Anyway, they have little subcommittees. And there's one, is, in most big corporations, one is called the Compensation Committee. <coughs> if you actually look at an annual report of a big company, you'll see at the back where they give you a little picture of the executives, they'll tell you which executive sits on which committee. And there'll be a subgroup. Uh, excuse me, members of the board of directors who sit on a committee and it's a compensation committee and so when it comes time to decide what the president of the company who sits on the board what his salary and bonuses will be he demurely and quietly leaves the room so that the committee that's left the compensation committee can present its report to the rest of the members of the board about how much they ought to pay him he is, meanwhile, down the hall, peeing, right? And waiting until he's called back in and is told this year it'll be 42 million instead of last year's mere 36 million. And that's in recognition of the wonderful work you've done. And how do they know he's done?